Good morning. Welcome to Church of the Resurrection here on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. My name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors. We are so glad you've tuned in this morning, that you've joined us for this special time of worship. In Psalm 84, which we'll read later in the service, the psalmist says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And we do long for God to be in his house, to enter into his presence, to worship him with mind, body, and spirit. And that's what we're here to do this morning. Will you please stand with me if you're able, and let's say together the opening acclamation. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and And blessed be his kingdom, kingdom, now now and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Now please join me in saying together the Collect for Purity in Worship. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let's sing together praises to our God and King. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. 
Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Now I invite you to kneel or be seated as you're able. And let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God, first in silence and then aloud together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and hear these words of assurance. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for Say a word, you're good, good father, to you 
are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable I can hardly speak Hi, I'm Joel. Anna, Elias, and Ayana. We live in Hyattsville, Maryland, and we've been attending rest for two and a half years. Please join us in praying the colic for children. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you have blessed our congregation with the joy and care of children. Give us courage, patience, and wisdom as we bring them up in the faith that they might never know a day apart from you. <laughs> Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um. Amen. Good morning. We are in the first season of ordinary time in the new year. During this green growing season, we study the life and ministry of Jesus. We listen to the words that Jesus said. We learn about the miracles that Jesus did. And we learn about the wonderful things that Jesus did in his ministry. We study God's good words and what they say about who Jesus is and how Jesus shows us who God is. Let's make our hearts quiet and get ready to hear from God's good words to us. Jesus' disciples were coming home. They had been out in the villages, healing the sick, casting out demons and unclean spirits, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. They were very tired. So Jesus said, let's go to a quiet place where we can rest. Now, a big crowd saw Jesus and his disciples leaving, and they ran after them. When Jesus saw this crowd, they seemed like a sh sheep without a shepherd. So instead of asking them to leave, Jesus healed them, and he taught them the way of the kingdom of God. For the whole day, Jesus taught and spoke the word of God. When evening came, Jesus' disciples asked Jesus, it's getting very late. Can we send the crowd away 
so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food to eat. But Jesus answered, you feed them. But the disciples did not have enough food and certainly not enough food for a huge crowd. One of the disciples said to Jesus, did you know that it would take a whole year's wages just to buy a little bit of bread for each of these people? What do you have? Jesus asked. Andrew, who was one of the disciples, said to Jesus, he spoke up and he said, there is a boy here, he has some food. He has five loaves of barley bread and two fish. But what good is that with a huge crowd? But the disciples were wrong. Jesus knew it didn't matter how much food that there was. God would make it enough. He would make it more than enough. So Jesus told the disciples and the crowd to take a seat in the green grass. And then Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks to God and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the crowd. And they broke the bread. And they broke the bread. And there was more and more bread as the bread kept breaking. And soon, all the people in the crowd ate. And they were full. And there was even bread left over. He did the same with the fish. He blessed it. He gave thanks to God for it, and he broke it. And as the disciples gave the fish to the crowd, more than 5,000 people had eaten. And they were all full. They all had enough to eat. And then Jesus said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them up and they filled 12 whole baskets with the pieces of bread that had come from five barley loaves and two fish. And the crowd looked at one another and they said, surely this man is a prophet who has come into the world. And they wanted to make Jesus their king. And Jesus, who knew that the crowd wanted to come and make him king by force, decided to slip away to a mountain by himself. Let's wonder together about God's good words. I wonder, what did the disciples think when Jesus asked them to find food for all of those people? Do you think some of them were ready to walk all the way to the villages to find food? How would they have enough money? Did some of the disciples try to obey Jesus? Or did others just give up because they thought it was impossible? I wonder what the disciples and the crowd thought when Jesus began breaking the bread and breaking it and breaking it and there was more and more and there was always more. I wonder 
How are the disciples feeling about this miracle that Jesus performed? I wonder how the crowd feels. Jesus knew the one who made all the fish in the sea. Jesus knew the one who at the beginning made everything out of nothing at all. It's what God had been doing since the very beginning, taking nothing and making everything from it. Taking emptiness and filling it and taking darkness and making it light. Jesus did many things like this, and we call them miracles. They were things that people thought couldn't happen. They weren't natural. I wonder, what does this miracle show us about who God is? I wonder what this miracle shows us about who Jesus is. I wonder, why did the crowd want to make Jesus their king? I wonder, why did Jesus slip away from the crowd? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for being a God who is so powerful, you can create everything out of nothing. Help us to have faith in Jesus that he can take our small offerings like the boy's bread and fish and by his power multiply them for his kingdom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you know that we are set in the midst of many grave dangers. And because of the frailty of our nature, we cannot always stand up right. Grant that your strength and protection may support us in all dangers and carry us through every temptation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our psalm this morning is from Psalm 84. We'll read it together responsively by whole verse. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. 
And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit what they, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. The word of the Lord. You know, we've just purchased our new facilities at 501 E Street Southeast, and I'm tempted with a story like this about the roof being peeled off and the paralytic being lowered down to go ahead and talk about what we need for our new building. But I think I'll spare you the theatrics. This story has such a great meaning to it and message to it, and there's enough there just for us to focus on today. So before we begin, let's pray together and ask God to help us understand what he has for us in this message. Almighty God, we praise and thank you for your word. We thank you for this story of Jesus healing a paralyzed man. And we pray that you would speak to us through it and draw us to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In today's passage, Mark tells us that Jesus is back at his home base in Capernaum on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he's presumably staying at Peter's house. Let's take a look at what was happening in verse 2. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. Mark chapter 2, verse 2. We often forget that Jesus' top priority wasn't miraculous exorcisms or healings, but the proclamation of the gospel. In Mark chapter 1, after Jesus' baptism, coming up out of the Jordan and the time he spent resisting temptation in the wilderness, the first thing he does to begin his ministry is to go into Galilee to preach the gospel. He had a life-changing, revolutionary message Listen to Mark 1, 15. Jesus said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In other words, the old regime's days were numbered. The insurrection that had begun so long ago in the garden and that had ushered in the reign of sin and death was about to be overcome by the resurrection of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but would have everlasting life. So Jesus, the Son of God, came proclaiming this gospel. But everywhere he went, he encountered the consequences of sin. Over the last several weeks, we've seen in Mark chapter 1 that as Jesus came preaching the gospel in each Galilean village, he also encountered those who were oppressed by demons or diseases, and he healed them. But again, the miracles were secondary to Jesus' mission. And as he said in Mark 1.38, he said, Let's go on to the next town and to the next town so that I may preach there also, for that's why I came. So now in today's passage, we find Jesus back in Capernaum. And as we saw in chapter 2, verse 2, he was continuing to preach the word. And as the story unfolds, Mark recounts another tale of healing this time of a paralytic. But again, the healing miracle is not the point of the story. Rather, Mark wants to deepen our understanding of the gospel by pointing us to something much more important than physical healing. Mark is the most efficient of all the gospel storytellers. 
What he does in 16 chapters takes Matthew 28 and Luke 24. Mark isn't going to repeat himself unnecessarily. Papyrus is expensive. And he's not going to show us again what he's already shown us, that Jesus is a miraculous healer. There's something else here that Mark wants us to see. And it begins with the four men in verse 3, carrying the paralytic in on a stretcher. Take a look at the love that they have for their friend. They know that Jesus can help him, so nothing will stop them in their mission to deliver him to Jesus. When the huge crowd blocks their way, they carry him up the stairs and begin peeling back the thick roof made of lumber and mud and grass. They're peeling it back, making a hole big, big enough to lower him down. Maybe they're lowering him down by ropes or maybe just handing him down to the crowd below. But one way or another, they deliver their friend to Jesus. The paralytic could not have had better friends. And what a timely picture of true friendship this is for us right now in these dark days, lonely days of the pandemic. We've never been more isolated from one another. We need deep, solid friendships to get through this. And it's often said that if you want a friend, you have to be a friend. Well, here's a compelling demonstration of the best kind of friend and how to be a friend like that. A true friend is someone who, like these fellows, Someone will help you get to Jesus. Someone who will carry you to Jesus if need be, even if you're too hurt to go yourself. You may be watching today because of friends like these. Maybe sometime in the past they carried you to Jesus, or maybe there are friends right now who are carrying you to Jesus. If you have believing friends like these, you are blessed, greatly blessed, richly blessed. This in and of itself is a compelling and vivid sign of God's love for you. Don't take such friends for granted. And don't stop them from demonstrating their love. Let them carry you to Jesus. God also may be calling you to be such a friend. There may be someone whom God has placed on your heart, but maybe you felt like you don't have too much in common with them. Well, shared experiences and interests can build a good friendship, but they aren't prerequisites. All that's needed is love. And Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is the best friend that ever was. And when you carry someone to Jesus, soon you'll find that you have the most important thing in the world in common together and the best possible foundation for a friendship. There's also an important corollary to this story and that has to do with the teamwork that we see with these four friends. Often a person is hurt so badly that you just can't carry them to Jesus by yourself. But if you'll join with other believing friends, you very well may discover that the team is able to do what you can't do by yourself in delivering your friend to the Lord. Now another wonderful thing about these friends is that they were undoubtedly wrong about the paralytic's greatest need. Even though Mark doesn't make this explicit, it's clear that these friends, as well as everyone else in the crowd that day, had incorrectly diagnosed what was the man's core problem. Anyone could see exactly what was wrong. The man was a paralytic. He couldn't walk. And so these four men brought him to Jesus so that his legs could be healed, so that he would go from broken to healthy, so that he might go from useless to useful, so that he would no longer be a burden to others, but instead would become valuable and productive. That's what everyone thought that he needed most, everyone that is except Jesus. Take a look at verse 5, where Jesus makes a different diagnosis. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine the look on the paralytic's face at that moment? And how he must have been feeling as he had been jostled and bounced all the way up onto the roof, lowered through the hole, in the spotlight with everyone looking at him, lowered all the way down to the ground. He might have been wondering the day before how things could get any worse. Well, now this is how. But again, Jesus' highest priority 
was proclaiming the gospel of his kingdom. That's what he'd been talking about with the crowd before the man came down through the roof. And now here's the perfect opportunity for Jesus to practice what he had been preaching, a teachable moment coming down from above. See, the descent of the paralytic is part of the journey into the kingdom. In the kingdoms of this world, the way up is up. And it's almost always up at the expense of others. It's zero sum, clawing, getting over others to get to the top yourself, getting up there only to be pulled down by someone else. That's what happens in the kingdoms of this world. But in the kingdom of God, the way up is down. To enter God's kingdom, you must first experience the death of repentance before you can be raised to new life. And for the paralytic to be raised to his feet, he first had to be lowered down, all the way down through the roof, down to the floor, down to the feet of Jesus, the King. There on the ground, despite what everyone knew was an orthopedic problem, Jesus diagnosed the root cause as something different, heart disease a kind of heart disease resulting from our broken relationship with God. And so verse five, Jesus said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Everyone else there was like, what, what, where did that come from? But for Jesus, he was simply demonstrating the same gospel that he had been proclaiming, that he had been delivering to everyone in the crowd, and by extension, delivering to all of us. Because like the paralytic, we all suffer from the same core problem, the same kind of heart disease resulting from our broken relationship with God. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And whatever our presenting symptoms may be, the treatment that we truly need, the treatment that will cure every symptom is God's forgiveness. All other healing is merely cosmetic because sooner or later we will die in our sins. It's the cure of forgiveness that Jesus offers us and that's why there's no better friend than Jesus. And as Mark will go on to show us, Jesus lay down his life for us, for our sins, so that we might be forgiven He died for us to ransom us from the petty kingdoms of this world and to restore us to the kingdom of God. So listen to his message. Repent and believe his gospel. Receive God's forgiveness for your sins and be healed of the heart disease that is truly the cause of every other symptom. Now you may be somewhat skeptical about this diagnosis of heart disease, Or perhaps you may agree that there's something to it, but uh, maybe you don't like Jesus' prescription. There's something kind of medieval about this requirement of humiliation through repentance. And there are so many religious leaders today who offer different interpretations, new interpretations of the old stories, and advocate ways to find God without all the bloody mess. So you may be legitimately wondering, why the descent of the paralytic has to be your prescription as well. If this at all describes you, well, you're very likely wondering what many in the crowd were wondering that day. Because as Mark tells us in verse six, some scribes, some religious professionals were also there. Scribes, it was their job to study the Old Testament law and to advise people how not to sin. And these scribes evidently weren't convinced that Jesus' message was helpful or that his miracles were real. They were rather quite skeptical about everything that was happening, and everyone else in the crowd knew it. So the crowd was watching them and watching Jesus and wondering who to believe. When Jesus said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven, the scribes began murmuring, verse 7, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And on the last point, they were absolutely right. All the sins that we commit 
whether not loving God with all our hearts or not loving our neighbors as ourselves, all of them are ultimately sins against God and his law. King David murdered his friend and slept with his friend's wife. But in Psalm 51, as he confessed all of this to the Lord, he said, against you and you only, Lord, have I sinned. Ultimately, all our sins are against God. So in forgiving the paralytic sins, Jesus was in effect claiming to be God. And for the scribes, that was blasphemy. Unless, of course, Jesus is the Son of God. God in the flesh, God made visible and brought near to save his people. If so, then the forgiveness that Jesus offers isn't blasphemy at all. It's rather the end of the insurrection and the long-awaited resurrection of God's kingdom in a way for people to enter into it on earth as it is in heaven. And if Jesus is truly God in the flesh and his forgiveness is truly the dawning of God's glorious kingdom, then the scribes are mistaken. Their interpretation of the Old Testament law is wrong. And as Jesus will go on to say in the next chapter, they're the ones who are guilty of blasphemy because of their opposition to the gospel. They're the very antithesis of true friendship, in fact, because instead of delivering people to Jesus, they do whatever they can to obstruct the way. So the question here is who's right and who's wrong? Is this paralyzed man's greatest need really forgiveness, as Jesus says, or physical healing, as everyone else in the crowd was thinking? And who are the paralytic's true friends, those who carried him to Jesus or the scribes who were obstructing the way? And what's actually happened here? Did Jesus blaspheme or did he welcome someone into the kingdom of God? Look again at verse 8 and following. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Once again, the miraculous healing is not the point of the story. Rather, it's an outward and visible sign of something much greater and more important. It's evidence not only of this man being freed from bondage to the prince of this world and resurrected into the kingdom of God. More importantly, it's evidence of Jesus being the long-awaited Messiah King. He wasn't blaspheming. He was rather giving something that only he could give, forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus' own journey, first down into the ground and then back up again to eternal life in the kingdom of God. And it's important that we recognize that Jesus' diagnosis of the paralytic was spot on. Jesus was right and everyone else there was wrong about what this man needed most. So we can trust Jesus. His words are true. His diagnosis of our condition is exactly right. For years, one of my greatest frustrations was taking our car in for service. There would always be some kind of expensive surprise whenever it happened. I'd drop the car off for an oil change and then wait for the call. And the phone would ring, and the service manager always had this smooth radio voice, would call me by my first name, would share his deep concern for my family, and then he would go on to describe how lucky we were that they had caught, they had discovered whatever the problem was while it was in the shop, rather than when my wife and kids were out on the highway. And it was always some essential component that I didn't know about or didn't understand, always something like the flux capacitor, and I could save a lot of money by having them fix it right now for only $999 if I acted fast. But regardless of what was wrong, my dilemma was always the same. Was the situation as dire as he really said? What if I ignored his warning? And then, sure enough, my family ended up stranded, maybe at the top of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge or down inside the 395 tunnel, because that's always where you imagine these things happening. 
In short, could I really trust this man? Could I trust his diagnosis of our car's condition? Well, thankfully, as many of you know, we've become friends with a terrific mechanic named Husni Almansor. He's one of the refugees from Syria that our church has had the privilege of helping. Our families are good friends. We've spent a lot of time together over the last several years, and we've found him to be completely trustworthy. And now whenever my car needs service, I call up Husni. He comes over to our house. He has a look. He tells us exactly what is wrong, and he fixes it for a fraction of the price. I know every time that Husni will tell me the truth, in this case, that flux capacitors don't really exist, they're only for DeLoreans, they're for time travel, and I really don't need one. But the point is, he's absolutely trustworthy. Honest diagnosis and treatment. It's what we want from a mechanic, from a plumber, from a physician, from a counselor, from a religious professional. It's what we want especially from God. And again, the point of today's story is not that Jesus was a miraculous healer. We already knew that. Rather, the point is that Jesus knows best, better than anyone else. Jesus knows what repairs we truly need. You can't always get what you want. But with Jesus, you do get what you need. His diagnosis is honest and trustworthy, and he's 100% effective in his treatment. Jesus knows best. More than any other friend or relative, counselor or coach, Jesus knows what you need, and if you'll trust him, he will make things right. So in closing, let's take notice of how everyone responded to Jesus that day. The paralytic, verse 12, not only got what he needed, but also what he wanted as well. Having descended down to the floor, he then rose again, picked up his bed, and walked out of his own accord healed in both his body and also in his relationship with God through Jesus' forgiveness of his sins. And the crowd also responded in verse 12 with amazement, glorifying God and saying, we've never seen anything like it. Another miraculous healing, even greater than what they had seen before. And yet it seems that most of them did not take it further, moving from Jesus' miracles to Jesus' message of the gospel. Because later, Jesus denounces three villages along the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, including the village of Capernaum, where this story happened. Because these villages had witnessed the miraculous signs that Jesus had done, and yet they did not repent and believe his message. And to this day, some 2,000 years later, those three villages remain in ruins on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. We also learn how the scribes responded to Jesus later on in Mark's story as they eventually conspired together to hand Jesus over for arrest and for torture and ultimately to be crucified. And as Jesus hung dying on the cross, they mocked him, saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Yet that's how he saved others, and that's how he can save you and me. Think about it. All eyes were upon him. He who had no sin, but who was made to be sin for us lowered down from the cross into the ground for three days and then resurrected as King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever. No one knows your need for healing better than Jesus who died and rose again. No one is a better friend than Jesus. No one has done more to heal you than Jesus. His message is even more important than his miracles. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the message that he proclaimed. It's the message that he continues to proclaim today. How will you respond to this message from Jesus 
the resurrected King of Kings. Will you pray with me? Help us, Lord, to repent and believe, to welcome your forgiveness, and to follow you with all that we are and all that we have. For we put our trust in you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often Rob Monk, uh, coming to you from uh, a white and snowy Michigan. Um, my wife, Rye, and I have been attending Res for around three years or so. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley Beach, our Archbishop, and Steed Breedlove, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our President Joe Biden, our Mayor Muriel Bowser, and Governors Larry Hogan and Ralph Northam, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or in any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I now invite you to add your own petitions at home.
Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As Christ our Savior has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hi, Rez. I'm Heather. I have been attending Rez since 2009, and I live in the H Street area of Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Justin, and I've been virtually attending Rez for nine months, and I live in Fairfax, Virginia. Please join us in making a confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We, we believe, believe in, in one God, God the Father, Father, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the peace of Christ. We've been encouraging folks to uh, send an email or a text message or make a phone call to others in the church as we continue to, uh, for the most part, worship from home. So do take a moment, whether now or later today, and reach out to someone and share God's peace with them. I want to share with you a few announcements about things that are happening in the life of our church. Um, first of all, is next Sunday, we will have no in-person service. So next Sunday is February 7th, no in-person service, but you can, of course, watch us here on Res TV. We've also uh, got some exciting things coming up with regard to our new building. Uh, on Sunday, February 14th, we will have uh, communion in the park and tours of the new building. We continue to give thanks to God for this new building. We're excited about all the things that are going to happen there uh, over the next months and years to make it our home and a place where we can do great ministry for the Lord Jesus. So sign up online, come along for communion in the park. That will not be at Lincoln Park as we've done it before, but at Marion Park, just across from our new building at 501 E Street Southeast. So it'll be at Marion Park, communion in the park and building tours. We'll take you in small groups to avoid exposure um, and go through the building, show you what it looks like now and share a little bit about uh, where we think God's taking us with regard to the building uh, going forward. Also, excitingly, we will be having an Ash Wednesday service in our new building on Wednesday, February 17th. There's some information about that on the website, so do sign up for that. What we'll do is we'll have several services throughout the day uh, so that you can come along and be part of one of those. We continue to have morning prayer Monday through Friday on Zoom at 8 a.m., Please do uh, find us through the link on the website, reschurch.org, and you can tune in at any time. It's about 20 minutes of prayer in the prayer book and 10 minutes looking at a passage from Mark's gospel, just like we're doing here in church. 
There's also a couple of opportunities midweek for you to get involved in some learning and education. One of them is our Christianity and Race Seminar that starts this Tuesday in just two days. You can still sign up. We'd love to have you. There's a, a form you can fill out on our website to jump into that. There's also weekly res groups. If you're looking for people to connect with, to find some community, uh, email me, reach out. Love to help you sign up for one of those groups. There's a bunch of buttons on our website as well, and I, I won't go over all of them, but if you're new, fill out the I am new button. We'd love to hear from you, give you some information about the church, and invite you to our next newcomers gathering. Um, so do, do fill that out and let us know. The other thing that's on our website is our give button. We continue to worship the Lord during this season of the pandemic, and uh, we do that in one way by giving our tithes and our offerings. These go to support not only the ongoing ministry of the church, things like our new building, um, but also our benevolence ministry uh, that we have been uh, doing. We, we gave something like seven or eight times uh, the benevolence giving in 2020 that we did in pr the previous year. And we anticipate that there continues to be a strong need for that. So do continue to worship God with your tithes and offerings, and also consider making a gift to our benevolence fund if you're able. And with that, let's stand once again and sing praises to the Lord. Travel through a barren land with danger stick on every hand, but Jesus guides us through the veil. Oh, the Christian soul can never fail. Great sorrows need. Well, it's been great to have you here to worship together, to hear God's word. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you back here next Sunday and hopefully at one of these opportunities to uh, worship outside near our new building or to come together on Ash Wednesday in coming weeks. And now let me send you out with the benediction. All our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ, and all of our hopes we set on the risen Christ. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.